Hello and welcome to the Crypto Insider interview. I'm Vlad and today is a very special occasion because on the 10th anniversary of Bitcoin, we get to talk to none other than the mother of Ross Albrecht, Mrs. Lynn Albrecht. Did I say that right? Correct. It's good to have you here. And yeah. you have no idea how influential your son is in this industry and how many millionaires exist today because of him? Well, maybe they'll help me get him out. I'm, and many have, but um, I'm going to continue to need financial support. So I hope some of those people will step up because I have a lot of lawyers right now. I, but, I remember yeah. the first time I heard about the case, I was in Paris, I think in 2014. And I was reading the Rolling Stone coverage which presented Ross as some sort of Billy the Kid of our times. Yeah, that was a horrible interview. Yeah, I, I remember. But I didn't know better either because- he I was, didn't know better either. I just talked to the guy, it was a mistake. He was portrayed <laughs> as a villain. Yeah. And that's all I could get at the time. It wasn't like I had all these resources. And right now, before the interview, I checked the website, the freeross.org website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have this series of documentaries which are called Railroaded. Railroaded, Railroaded yeah. that's right. And I, the I targeting the and caging of Ross Ulbricht. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've watched the first couple of them and they're very informative and they reveal a lot about the U.S. judiciary system. Mm -hmm. Well, and also it's important for people to realize it's completely based on the record. We're not saying any opinion or what we think. This is all just strictly taken from the public record. And, and we did it because we realized we didn't even know everything, never mind people reading the media, which is so limited. And so we started putting it together and it became kind of a narrative, really. And then we, um, someone said, hey, do an audio component. And we were very lucky to have a volunteer, a volunteer supporter who's a professional narrate it. And then we just added pictures to go along with the narration to make kind of a little video. And it's quite, um, I think, very riveting. Um, and it does reveal a lot. And again, it is all the, on the record. It is not us saying, oh, we think this happened or some theory. Now, it may still not be true, but it is based on the government's record and the official record and all kind of, it, you know, everything that's out there as the record. But why do you think there is still this image of Ross being the guy who tried to hire some hitman to attack some person. Yeah, and by the way, that particular person has come out and said they don't think it was Ross and that, um, you know, he's come out very much in support of Ross. Um, that's Curtis Green. I think it's because the government does this. Uh, it is, I've been told by criminal justice attorneys, uh, I mean, defense attorneys, that they, this is, very, very common that they take unproven allegations and smear people with it. And that's what they did with Ross. And of course, the media loves sensationalism. I mean, it's much more exciting to talk about, you know, this, per, you know, like you say, this Billy the Kid who arranged murders, blah, 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 instead of what really it was, which was Ross was an idealist. He was, he was very passionate about free markets and, um, privacy and the monetary potential of for freedom through bitcoin and that is why he came up with the idea of this marketplace not because he's some kind of kingpin thug i mean everybody who knows ross knows it's absurd there's a hundred letters on our website by people who do know ross read those and see if you think he's really um you know did this and um so but the media, look, I don't, I've gotten to the point after all of this, I believe very little immediately what I read in the mainstream media. I just like, well, maybe that's true, but it's probably not, you know, honestly, and that's sad, but I, that's what I've come to after this whole thing. Right now, I'm 26 years old, just as old as Ross was when he started Silk yeah, Road. Right. And I think this age is special for a lot of people because we realize that we're all alone in this world. We have finished university and we have completed our studies and we, we have to either 
pursue our dreams and see how we can fulfill what we have been thinking about all these years or we just give in and sell out to some kind of big corporation and take mm -hmm. a regular job and say that mm -hmm. this is it i'm going to have a normal life and i'm going to give up on my dreams and i think he was part of the inspiration why i decided to get into journalism in this space because mm -hmm. i have a degree in political science i i guess i could work for the government and i could do some administrative jobs but at the same time i find much more freedom and liberty not not because i would have anything to hide but because i feel like bitcoin and cryptocurrencies give to the world a degree of freedom and transparency which teaches governments to treat us better mm -hmm. yeah well I'll, I'll tell ross that you inspired that in you know that he inspired that in you that's great he, he also inspired, and I read about it, the creator of Litecoin, Charlie Lee, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, who said right. that he didn't know about Bitcoin before reading a news article about the Silk Road. Mm -hmm. And I think yep. it was also Eric Voorhees, who is a yeah. big advocate of the cause. Yeah, he is. Um, right. And, and Charlie and Eric and Roger Veer and others in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space have promoted the petition we have, which is really important. And I'm really urge everyone to please sign this petition at freeross.org uh, slash petition or just freeross.org, there's a big banner, asking the president to uh, commute Ross's sentence. Um, this sentence is barbaric, double life plus 40 years for no, all nonviolent charges for a first time offender is evil and a huge abuse of government power that really needs to be put, uh, changed. And so please, you know, follow Eric and Roger and Charlie Lee and others who have come out and said, the whole Libertarian Party has said, uh, Ross needs clemency, um, but many in the cryptocurrency space. In fact, I'm doing a video um, project and I've got, taken quite a few because I've been at a couple of conferences of people, and maybe you would like to make one, Vlad. Um, I would love to. Uh, yeah, it's just a little, just why you signed the petition, why you support Ross, why he shouldn't be in prison, whatever you want to say, and then at the end, free Ross. And I'm, I want to get about 300 people in the crypto space doing this to show, along with the petition, to show the president, hey, you, have the, you would have the support of the cryptocurrency community. They'd be very grateful if you would free Ross. Though I don't know if my statement would make a difference because I'm not a U.S. citizen, so. No, well, you don't have to be a U.S. citizen to sign the petition. I consider it a worldwide grassroots effort, and I think it does matter what other people in other countries think about what we're doing over here. So, yeah, no, don't, don't be left out because of that. I also think that the USA is setting precedence for the rest of the world. That's correct. They were the first ones who in, indicted and prosecuted such crimes. And I guess the European Union and other countries will just take the example and say, you know, if somebody opened a website on the dark web, we're going to do the same because we have an example of what they did. I'm, I don't see my government being any better in this regard. Mm -hmm. Where are you from? I'm from Romania. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yes, the United States, somebody said, well, when the United States catches a cold, the rest of the world sneezes kind of thing. And uh, yeah, it matters here, even if you're not an American, uh, what the criminal justice system in this country does. Um, so yeah, please don't let that stop you from signing the petition or being part of this video um, project that I'm doing. I happen to know a case when the brother of one of my former high school classmates was murdered in public and the mur murderer got only 15 years in prison. That happens here too. They release violent people all the time. And to, to have someone like Ross, I mean, even the guards and the staff at the prison are like, why is he in here? What, what, you know, what's he doing in here? And actually his security score uh, qualifies him for a low security prison, which is a whole lot different than where he is right now, which is a maximum security prison with violent people, dangerous gangs. Because, and he's only there because he has a life sentence. Um, otherwise he wouldn't be in that prison. 
And um, this is so wrong. And in fact, recently, he six weeks ago, he uh, refused to participate in an assault on another inmate. And, and so he had to put himself in protective custody because that made him a target because he was defying that. And um, he's been in basically a metal box now for six weeks. It's pretty rough. And uh, Ross isn't violent. That's why the murder for hire allegations are so out of character and bizarre and not believable. I mean, he's got a history, well-documented history of being peaceful, compassionate. Even the, um, the philosophy of the Silk Road was about doing no harm, not having violent services or things that created victims on there. So it, it just doesn't make sense. But do you think the case was actually against Bitcoin? Because mm -hmm. Yep. In many ways, it was the first of, of its kind. We haven't seen anything like it before. And they, I don't want to speak about something I don't know much about, but it might have been cybercrime on his record. Um, I definitely think it was, I've come to the conclusion that I do think the whole reason they came down so hard on Ross was Bitcoin. Um, the person who instigated the whole thing was uh, Senator Chuck Schumer from New York. He was a very influential member of the Senate Finance Committee, the Banking Committee. He's very involved with Wall Street and the financial powers. And he's the one that said, we've got to not only take down Silk Road, get it, the person running it, but also take down Bitcoin. And in fact, um, the NS, it came out just this past March from Snowden documents, The Intercept published it, that um, NSA was tracking Bitcoin users a few months before Ross was arrested. Now they're supposed to be tracking terrorists and people like that, but they were very worried about Bitcoin. And I think that is why they came down so hard on Ross because the other defendants in the Silk Road case that were convicted of actually selling drugs and a lot of drugs is what their conviction was. The, the biggest sentence was 10 years and it goes down from there. Meanwhile, Ross gets double life and so, yeah, I, I think you're very right that it, it was really not about drugs. It was about this upstart crypto, this upstart, yeah, cryptocurrency that they had no control over. And it's like, wait, what, what is this? This cannot be. We've got to get rid of this. I think that's the price a lot of people pay for being way ahead of their time. Mm -hmm. It was the same with Galileo when he was sentenced to house arrest for his research just because he was ahead of his time and maybe reached some sort of, or made some kind of discovery which was revolutionary, but not accepted by the establishment. Because right now, Wall Street is very involved in Bitcoin and they're trying to yeah, open right, trading exactly. desks and they're trying to provide ETFs and all sorts of services for people, regular people to buy Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. right now it's like a corporate cryptocurrency. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's come a long way, which is great. But meanwhile, one of the pioneers and, you know, he's Ross has been called the second most important figure in Bitcoin history next to Satoshi because it was a the first proof of concept for Bitcoin. It was the first place where people actually used it and it became known. And to have him sitting in prison for the rest of his life when this is going on, you know, and have him painted as some kind of drug kingpin when what he really is, is a technological pioneer and visionary and idealist who, who, you know, look, he was 26 years old, like you say, and he, you know, he's, he doesn't need to be in prison for the rest of his life to not build another Silk Road. He's, <laughs> that's not going to happen. He's that hasn't been on the internet in five years. How's he, you know, it, it, it's just a, it's very, it's a, punitive sentence it's a cruel sentence and the, he's not the only person by the way in our system that has these horrible excessive sentencing um he has a friend in there tony who is serving a life sentence because an informant said he sold marijuana 13 years ago marijuana and the the prison is a federal prison in colorado where it's legal at the state level so it's it's just outrageous it's just horrible and um, we have to, you know, it just can't stand. It has, Ross needs to be out. He has a lot to contribute and he, he's not a threat to anyone. There's no reason to have him in, in prison at the taxpayer's expense, which by the way, for a life sentence is like $2 million per inmate. 
I actually agree because in the early days of Bitcoin, they would just speculate on the uses of it. They would just say, I think that we can also use it to buy this. A guy named Laszlo has actually bought pizzas with his Bitcoin, uh-huh. but then came along Silk Road and they proved that they can create a free market, which is not bound to the regulations of the state. And mm-hmm. it's completely free and it's anonymous. I mean, pseudonymous, not completely anonymous. Mm-hmm. It can be tracked if you have the right information, but they just proved, I mean, it wasn't just Ross and we can agree on this because Dread Pirate Roberts was accessed from many places. There were many people behind the account. Mm -hmm. Ross got all the blame and was was held responsible for everything that was said and done by DPR. But then when he was in solitary confinement, DPR logged into the Silk Road forum that Ross was in jail. So it's, it, that's just definitive proof that there was more than one person operating on, with that. Curtis Green said, well, yeah, there were lots of DPRs. I acted as DPR. The corrupt agents who were all over the site and had the ability to change anything on the site, they had the ability to commandeer G- DPR's account and other accounts. Who knows what, who actually said what or did what? And, and this was all brought, tried to be brought up at trial and the judge just, kept shutting it down. So, you know, it's a very, and if you watch Railroad it or listen to it, you know, it's on uh, iTunes and, and SoundCloud too, or just read it. With It has almost 400 footnotes, um, if you really want to dig. And um, then you go, why is he in prison? This is, should not be allowed. This is wrong. In the first episode of Railroad it, there are many mentions of Mark Carpelles of Mount Gox. Mm-hmm. And he's presented as a guy who could potentially had been involved with Silk Road. Yet there is no proof about it. And he was never arrested, even though he pretty much bankrupted and shut down Mount Gox and ran away with people's money. Well, again, this is just what the record said. And uh, I'm not and certainly Ross is not accusing anybody of anything without proof or anything like that. It's simply communicating what is in the record, what the lead investigator believed. Um, and uh, it's just part of the story. But uh, it's true that Mark Carpellis, um, you know, was not arrested for that. Uh, it did come out at trial. I was sitting right there, even though the judge said, well, forget you heard it, that um, his lawyers did arrange a meeting with um, uh, investigators from Maryland and offered to give them a name of DPR if they would back off Carpellis because they were after him. And um, shortly thereafter, Ross was arrested. I'm not saying he did gave Ross's name. I have no idea whose name he gave. I just know the sequence of events that are in the public record. That's strange. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But do you think that this administration is different from the Obama one? Uh, Oh, well, I think it's very different in a lot of ways. I do have some hope because uh, President Trump has said he wants to pardon 3,000 people. He's interested in people who've been treated unfairly by the system. He's already started pardoning people, pardoning, giving them clemency, like Alice Johnson recently got um, out, and she, it it was a... um, commutation of her sentence. Uh, So it's not exactly a pardon, but it's basically the same thing. And um, so I'm hopeful that he does want to do this. And if he can be made to see that Ross has the support of the crypto community, uh, of a lot of people, that um, he's not what he's been painted to be, and that he this sentence is wrong and sets a terrible precedent for everyone, for all of us, for other people who are in there. It, it's just wrong to give a double life sentence plus 40 years to, oh, I'm so sorry, God, um, to a um, first time offender who, you know, is nonviolent. This didn't used to happen in our country uh, before the drug war. Now, this judge is particularly known for very harsh sentencing. Ross, uh, that year alone was her fifth life sentence for just those, and he was sentenced in May. So that was first five months of that year of 2015, she'd already given four life sentences. This is not typical, but there are a lot of sentences that are way, way too long. 
So what is the procedure to get another hearing from a different judge? Uh, it, well, you know, besides asking for commutation, there is something you can do, which is file what's called a habeas petition uh, by next year that is basically making the re giving the reasons why Ross didn't get a fair trial and um, asking a judge, which normally would be that same judge, but luckily she is gone. She's retired. That was really good news because <laughs> um, I can't imagine her giving Ross another trial. But um, so if we get a good judge who can see this and they would maybe potentially grant Ross another trial. It's, it's usually those are hard to get, but we're trying. That's one of the lawyers that I need help paying. Uh, and uh, I have several. <laughs> so. I think we have discussed some specific portions of this case. But what if, let's say that somebody got into the cryptocurrency space last month and they have mm -hmm. no idea of the Silk Road situation and who Ross is, but how would you present the case in about a few sentences? Um, well, I would say that Ross is the person who had the idea to have a free market um, that, was, that protected privacy and use the cryptocurrency Bitcoin because he saw the potential for monetary freedom through cryptocurrency. And um, many things were, you know, allowed on the side. It was pretty much up to people who were on the site to decide. So drugs were allowed, but nothing was allowed. And there were many legal things, by the way. And I've been told that parents of children with life-threatening seizures were able to get CBD that, that, that was helping them so much. And then when the site went down, they couldn't get it. Uh, but also things like art and books and uh, clothing and jewelry and all kinds of things, electronics and on and on, were sold but also drugs were sold, mostly personal use amounts of cannabis. That was 70% of the drugs that were sold, never hardly mentioned at trial. And um, but it was up to people if they wanted, what they wanted to do in terms of drugs. So that was very illegal, but it was uh, not considered a victim, making victims because it was a free choice. No one was forced. But things like anything to do with pedophilia or um, weapons or violence or um, stolen property, things that did harm people that made them victims were not allowed. So this site was up there and it became the first proof of concept for Bitcoin because that's the only thing that was allowed to be used to exchange things and it, it took off. And so as far as Bitcoin con is concerned, um, and, I, and, I, and as we discussed, I think it was um, why the government was so alarmed about the site and also just the fact that it was the internet and the dark web and everything um, is a new thing. Uh, they put Ross in prison for the rest of his life for coming up with this idea and putting it online, basically. So please sign the petition if you don't think that's right. Please go to freeross.org and sign the petition. Uh, we're trying to get him out. We're trying, he's got a lot to contribute. He's a smart guy, he's a visionary. He's a good person and, um, you know, he doesn't deserve or need to be uh, in prison for the rest of his life. And you can learn a lot more at freeross.org. It's a very dense website. You can also learn by reading or listening to Railroaded, the caging and targeting of Ross Ulbricht. And we all need to be concerned because there's a lot of things that in this case, and it's hard to go into now, but that affect our personal protections as Americans, but also as we discussed, has a ripple effect around the world. And um, it's, it's uh, important for people to be aware because we're, we're really on, I believe, on the verge of um, kind of a tipping point in history and it can go either way. And we want it to go towards freedom, not towards more government surveillance and control. And we have to make some decisions and, to, and get involved, like you were saying you did, you know? Yeah, I should mention that I got involved as an individual and as a private person. And my, my views in this interview do not necessarily reflect those of the company that I work for. So Crypto Insider does not necessarily believe in- Oh, right, 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 right. I should okay. put this disclaimer somewhere. Okay. <laughs> but also, could yeah. you please tell me about several people who visited Ross or got involved and they're famous in the Bitcoin community? 
Well, Roger Bear has been tremendously supportive um, financially from way long ago. Um, he's himself spent time in prison. He is very much against the drug war and he's very much for freedom. And so he's really stepped up. Um, Eric Voorhees visited Ross in prison. Um, they got along great. Eric's been um, supportive financially as well as, um, you know, in other ways. Um, trying to think as far as people known in the Bitcoin space that have actually visited Ross, because it's not easy. You've got to go through a whole thing. Um, I'm not exactly sure if there's other, and Roger hasn't actually met Ross. Um, but a lot of, as we discussed earlier, ha people have um, uh, supported him, you know, and um, are very much see what's really going on here. So. Were there others who donated money but didn't visit? Yeah, no, there have, and a lot of it's anonymous because it's through cryptocurrency. <laughs> so I don't, I don't really necessarily know who they are. You know, it's because it's through cryptocurrency. So, but That's... but do you think if Ross was set free tomorrow, he would still be interested in Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? Oh yeah, he's interested now. I mean, we send him charts and mm -hmm. information. He's he's keeping up with it, and um, no, he's very interested in it. And um, it's frustrating because he can't get on the internet, <laughs> mm -hmm. but he's very, very interested in it, yeah. Did Still. he ever mention something about cryptocurrencies which makes him feel excited? Well, just the fact that he's seen it grow the way it has. He's, he's very excited about, you know, that he has actually seen it um, take off from what, 50 cents or whatever it was when he got into it and, and increased 300,000 times, you know, it's, uh, it's uh he thinks it's great and so yeah for him it's you know he's frustrated because he can't be part of it in the same way but he keeps up with it and um people send him stuff um he's he's written about um i believe bitcoin magazine and coindesk are both going to publish things from him for the anniversary and um you know he's trying to stay in touch but you know it's hard when you can't get on the internet or email or anything I remember in that Rolling Stone interview, which we can both agree that was terrible, yeah. but yeah. one part which inspired me at the time and made me feel, you know, I feel exactly the same. When they mentioned that he was just walking around the university campus, just mm -hmm. doing research papers and trying to get involved in his field of study. Mm -hmm. and at some point he became disillusioned with what he was studying. I'm not sure, was it medicine or chemistry? He um, was studying physics. He was a physics major in undergrad, and he actually was working on solar energy projects there. And then um, when he went to graduate school, he studied material science, which uses physics, but other things as well. And so he's, he's, a, he's a scientist. He's never been a computer programmer. He was never trained in it, doesn't know much about it, really, except some things he's taught himself. Uh, but he was a scientist, yeah. He was studying to be a scientist. So. But I guess his breaking bad moment, if we can call it that, <laughs> re resonates with a lot of people who are in academia. Right now I'm doing my PhD and I mm -hmm. look at the research papers which I have to write and I think to myself, you know, this is pointless. Nobody's ever going to care. Mm -hmm. We got to this point where you can either be revolutionary, but nobody's going to care about what you write and they're not going to read it. it it's like a system of self-flattery and uh -huh. what we well, like to call a circle jerk where people oh, geez. yeah well yeah so you got disillusioned yeah and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i just looked I, I got into bitcoin just because it has this potential to maybe mm -hmm. take the governments we yeah. have reached a degree of intrusion in our privacy which in many ways is irreversible without well, that's, that's, the, so that's the thing, right? That's the thing. And that's what Ross was super concerned about was the privacy issue and being it. And of course, without privacy, you're not free. You know, you can't have a free life if you have a surveillance state. It's just not, it, they go hand in hand. Privacy and freedom go hand in hand. And I suppose the judge who was in charge of the case was not maybe able to comprehend all the dimensions of this. I mean, you said that she retired, so I guess she was older than 
Ross no, she's, is part of Oh, well, she's older than Ross, yeah. He was 54 or something, yeah. So it, it was maybe hard for her to comprehend how the internet works and mm -hmm. why we should have privacy, even in the online space. Well, she was also recommended by Chuck Schumer, who is behind the whole case. <laughs> so you have to wonder how much was, did that influence her? Because she wasn't just didn't understand. She was, uh, I think, had made up her mind. This is my personal opinion. It looked to me like she had already made up her mind way before she finally sentenced Ross to double life. You don't send somebody a double life when she could have given him 20 years mandatory minimum without some kind of agenda, in my personal opinion. Uh, it, it reminds me of that Bob Dylan song, Hurricane, in a way. Uh, I don't know you that know one. Or maybe I do if you start singing it. But <laughs> It's about a boxer who was arrested wrongly and had to oh. serve 10 years in prison for nothing just because he was black and at the time oh. they were racist. Oh, okay. okay. And he was about to become the world champion because he was a very good boxer, but he never mm -hmm. got the chance to just because he happened to be the wrong person at the wrong, wrong time, just there when a crime happened. Yeah, that happens to a lot of people where they just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's called, it's a conspiracy. There's so many stories, you know, when you start going to the prison, it's just so heartbreaking because of the stories you hear. And then you see the kids who are coming to see their fathers and they're so happy and then they leave and they're crushed and sobbing and it just destroys families it it it's just it's really serious stuff and uh wrong i mean it's way worse than what it used to be as i was saying before 19 1980s so um the the country has gotten much more draconian in its criminal justice system but people are still doing drugs right i mean they can't even keep drugs out of the prison but they are um, doubling down on that drug war. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's uh, difficult. It's very difficult for people who have loved ones in there because you're doing time too, just like they are. What was your initial reaction when you heard about the, the whole situation? Oh, I was shocked, uh, totally shocked. I mean, I, it was really hard to believe because Ross had never, you know, he wasn't particularly, you know, he never really into drugs in any kind of way that was a problem or in, with the law or anything like that. I know him to be the sweet, peaceful person. And then I hear all this stuff all of a sudden. And um, it's been pretty, it's ever since then, my whole life changed. That was five years ago. And um, it's been, it's been a hard road. It's been really a, a steep climb. But I, the more I learn about how things are going in our country, the more I see it as a greater cause as well. Because I, I do, I think we're losing our freedoms. I think we really need to wake up. I really appreciate your involvement and your advocacy in this direction. Thanks. Well, good. I, I appreciate yours too. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. <laughs> okay. So this interview will get published as soon as possible. Great. And I'm Great. going to write a complete transcript. So you will also have the text if it serves. Oh, that's helpful. Yeah, that's great. Great. You can thank post you. anything yeah. on the free Ross website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I no, thank I'm, you. I'll definitely push it out. Get Send me the link mm -hmm. and I'll, you know, you can put it out there. It. You can just do yeah. whatever you want with it. Sure. Great. And Thanks. this was a yeah. great pleasure and honor. I had no idea I was able to get this at first. I just wrote a tweet and then you sent a message to Blakely and he told me, you know, we got this message from the Free Ross Twitter account. And I was like, yay. <laughs> good, <laughs> good. Yeah. I'm really not that hard to get. <laughs> well, so. uh, but, I, I, but, uh, but really, I want to help uh, spread the word and I appreciate people who are doing that.